last week we did some experiments with the Android Studio and with the basic setup for the mobile application development. Um, so you will have to do a little bit at home um, and on like Tuesday session, the one, the two hour session that we have, which we don't have lectures to kind of uh, get up to speed with the programming. So those of you who didn't do any mobile programming, you have to do a little bit of extra work. Um, so I recorded yesterday um, kind of a, a video lecture on um, on using intents and doing kind of a basic setup for passing parameters between the intents and how to work with Android Studio and how to work with um, uh, Gradle, the command line utility for building Android tests. And I also talked a little bit about tests. So you need to watch this video and then kind of uh, play with the code. The code is, um, I will put the code for this course in the, um, in the course repo. So we play a little bit more with some of the decentralized technologies in this course. The code with, that I've used, um, I will place here as well. So um, the code uh, from the lecture is available if you go, if you go to the, um, the GitLab and say course and say IMT3673, um, slash 2020. So then the code is in this repo. So if you go, oops, crap. Yeah, if you go to the uh, course and go to the labs. You can clone the repo. The code from the lecture is here. Um, so it's in the mobile course. Um, so please watch the video and please check the code. I will not spend time uh, here on this. Uh, and then there is a second lecture video which I also posted. Um, and that one is kind of a, a little bit a repeat of what we did initially uh, to discuss the course and it talks uh, about some of the decentralized technologies and about liquid democracy and so on. So it's a, a one hour lecture which kind of repeats the some fundamentals about the mobile space. So we over, already did that. So it, it, as I'm saying, it's a little bit of a repeat of what we did here, but it's um, kind of a, it introduces some new concepts. And then I will post a third video, which is about blockchain technology, right? So the, the topic for today is supposed to be blockchain. Um, but it has two aspects. So the one which is covered in the lecture, which I will post, um, is a kind of a high level overview of the, uh, of where the technology came from and where it fits and so on, right? So it's kind of more of a background. It would have been better if you watched the video before, but you can watch it after. Uh, what we will do today, I will kind of talk a little bit more about uh, what, like how it works inside and what it means for us, like for um, uh, working with decentralized technologies and with mobile technologies, okay? Um, so please watch those three videos. Uh, use the time tomorrow to play a little bit with Android and with Android Studio. Those of you who want to do iOS, play with iOS um, and try to play with some of the peer-to-peer -peer libraries. So if you're already familiar with the content, uh, I try to uh, play with some of the um, decentralized technologies. I will list them after the class in the um, on the on the slides here on the wiki. Um, so the the concept for the next two weeks is we will introduce blockchain. We will introduce some peer to peer technologies and libraries. Um, and then we will start playing with them using Android or iOS. Um, we have two additional lecturers who will be giving lectures here. And one will be related to blockchain and Lightning Network. Um, the other one will be related to um, self-sovereign identity systems. Uh, so that is how we identify ourselves and how we can have a decentralized model for identifying us. 
So those two will happen kind of in the next two, three weeks. Um, this I will post some libraries uh, after the class and you watch the, you watch the lectures. So what we will do today is we will talk a little bit about underlying technologies which kind of make this happen. So this is the plan for the next two, three weeks. But er, like initially, I, I will give you a little bit of a background of what we need to know to, um, to deal with all those technologies. So let me just change this view. All right. So first thing uh, is hashing. What is hashing? Anyone? Yep. Okay. For what? For Yeah, but in general, where do you use hashing for? Yeah. So what can you hash? Okay, good. So this is is irreversible, right? What does it mean? That's right. So it's kind of a one-way function, right? So we take it's a function which takes some argument and it produces kind of the output, um, and then from the output, so it takes something in, right? From the output, we cannot get the in back, right? So it's kind of a one-way function to prevent something to ca have kind of another function which takes the out and gives us the what was here, right? So this is not possible or it's very, really hard, right? So it's not like it's not possible. It is possible. If you're really lucky, you can kind of find out what this is by uh, guessing it, right? But typically, it's really computationally hard to do that and it takes many uh, computer years to kind of do this, right? Um, so this is one property. What's the other property that we want from hashing? Yeah. Sure. So if you have the hash, so again, so we have some hashing function which takes some input. We get the uh, the hash value of that input. So from the hash value, we can very quickly check if this hash value is for the input by doing the one-way transfer, right? So we can kind of take the in and see, oh yes, it's it's a valid hash, right? Um, so that's what we do when we use it for for hashing passwords. So when we uh, type in the password, the system doesn't check if the password matches. It checks if the hash matches, right? Um, what what is another property that we want from hashing? So we want the function to be one way. We want the reverse to be really hard. We want um, the check to be quick, right? Uh, what else? There are two more important properties that we would like to have. So what happens if I have hash for input 1 and hash for input 2. What do we want? We want them to be different, right? Uh, we would like them to be different. So if hash for in 1 and hash for in 2 is x and it's the same, what does it, what is it called? Collision. It's a hash collision, right? So why this is not desirable? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. 
So what can happen is I have uh, I have one document and I have another document and this document says uh, Marius should get you know uh, twenty dollars salary and that one says Marius should get one million dollar salary, right? And then some validation system checks which one is the valid document and it cal calculates the hash. And if there is a collision, I can sneak in, in you know incorrect document which hashes to the same value and then I would say it's illegitimate, right? So hash collisions are not good, uh, but, so that one property, what's the other property we want? What do we want about the output? Yep. Uh, it's always the same length. Uh, exactly. Whether or not the, the input has a fixed length or not, the input length is not important to the hash function. Exactly. So we want the out to be fixed length. But the in can be infinite, right? It can be arbitrary long string, right? So what does it tell us? Can we have, can we prevent collisions? If we have output being fixed length and input being arbitrary long. Yeah? Well, so let's say I have uh, input being um, a string, right, a text, and the output being four bits, right? How many different output combinations do I have? 16, right? How many input combinations do I have? Okay, right? Will I prevent collisions? No. I will have collisions, right? I, I cannot not have collisions because this is just way too small, right? What if I say, okay, let's make it bigger, 256 bits, right? How many combinations now do I have? Kind of a large number, right? Right? Um, but will I not have collisions? I will have collisions. I will always have collisions. So, um, we need to change our constraint like saying we don't want collisions at all to something else. So what do we want about the collisions? Yeah? Finding a set of collisions is very unlikely. Exactly. So we want the same property as this one. So we want um, the process of finding, like if we know, for example, we have one input which hashes to x. And now we want to find something else that hashes to x. Right? We want to find a collision, right? We want this to be hard. This process of finding what hashes to x also to be hard, right? Um, and if you if you think about it, um, if you think about it, it's like um, we have bins. We often talk about bins when we talk about hash functions. So in the case of like having uh, five bins and kind of an infinite space some instances of this kind of input space will map to different bins, right? So what we want is we want this process of mapping between the domain and the bins to be quite random, right? So we want no regularity of how some things here map to a particular bin. We want it to be as random as possible because then finding the collision is hard and then reversing the, the um, like, Tracking the hashing is hard, right? So if this mapping to the bins, because in, in the case of four bits, we only had 16 those bins, right? So we have 16 of them. If, if, if we increase it, if we have, you know, eight bits, then we have 256 bins, but we will still have multiple things mapping to the same bin, right? But we want this to be, um, as random as possible, right? So good hashing function is fast. It maps the input to the particular output to the particular bin uh, in a random fashion. Finding the collision is hard and reversing the hash is hard. Okay? Make sense? Yeah, what do you yeah, want? So the, the input, if you have two inputs that look kind of similar, yeah. the output will be very good. Exactly. So if we have two similar inputs, 
differing by one bit, uh, you know, it's completely random which bins they will end up with, right? Uh, there is no regularity. Perfect. So now uh, we covered hashing. So hashing is, is covered. So now uh, let's introduce consistent. Anyone knows what that is? All right, so we will learn. Um, what will happen if I have my domain, I have my text or items here, I have the bits, and let's say we are using eight bits, right? And then I say, um, I need to kind of, uh, it's too weak, I need to go to nine bits, right? So I had my original uh, 256 uh, bins, right? But I added one extra bit into my space, right? And then I have more bins, right? So let's say I had kind of a text here, which was mapping to this bin. Uh, I introduce more bins now. What will happen to this um, if I hash A and it was, let's say, hash a was hashing to zero. If I change this, what will happen to this? Will it still hash to zero or not? Any ideas? So if you have, what hashing functions do you know? Yeah? SHA series, right? So let's say I have SHA 128, right? And I take a string Marius, right? And I uh, try it. I will get a particular hash, right? And now I use SHA-256. Will I get the same hash? No, of course not. Uh, will it has any similar bits? No, it will be completely different, right? So I expanded the, the, the size of my uh, bins, but the, the hash is completely different, right? There is no consistency. Uh, by changing, by expanding or shrinking the size, what happens to the hash is like all the bits. So if, I, if my hash is a, a sequence of bits, for 128 I have 128 of them, for 256 I have 256 of them, so I have extra ones. So I have the 128, same as here, plus the extra, right? Because I expanded. And all the bits are completely different, right? So consistent hashing is a hashing which retains the original bits, even though we expand or shrink the space of where we want to, the mapping to happen, right? So we want a hashing function which kind of maps us to bins and if we make more bins the or original material which was hashing to that bin will still map to that bin and then if we shrink or expand it will kind of uh, map the same. Of course if we have something mapping to a bin which kind of got cut right then it needs to remap to some of the existing bins the ones which are left over right. Um, so consistent hashing is a variation on the hashing function to have a property such that if we have our um, um, if we have our kind of our keys mapping to values and we expand the possible value range or shrink it, the existing keys which keep mapping to the ones which still exist will kind of continue to work, right? So we don't need to change everything, we just only need to change, as, uh, like if we're expanding, we don't need to change anything, and if we're shrinking, we only need to uh, remap the ones which kind of got shrunk, yeah? Yeah. 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 
It, it should go to the original place. Okay. Yeah. So when you have kind of a shrinking and then expanding, the, the items which were mapping to the particular slot should, after expansion, map to that same slot. Right? Does it make sense? All right. So then we have some algorithms which are kind of in this category or in this category. Uh, why is um, why is this category more interesting for peer-to-peer uh, -peer and decentralized systems? Well, what do you think? Any kind of guess? Again, yeah, what else? Yeah, yeah, but more of a value. Um, the one argument is that in a peer to peer systems, you have kind of more dynamism, right? So things kind of new nodes come up and some nodes disappear and you need to deal with the flux of who is available, who is not available, right? So, um, sometimes you need to be more flexible and then a small change, if it leads to very cascading effect, like that you need to change everything, it's kind of not desirable because it's very costly and things change all the time in peer-to-peer -peer systems, right? So you want kind of, kind of robustness that a small change leads to small change, right? Uh, and there is a lot of small changes happening all the time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about one specific use case where we have uh, a hash table, right? So how normally a hash table works? As the name suggests, we have a table <laughs> and we have a hash function, right? Hash table, right? Why do we use hash tables? Yeah. Uh, the, the lookup table is just like a hash function that you have like a lot of process in one process. That's right. So in the typical table, um, I have or um, array, I will have index, and then I will have a value. Value one, value two, value so on. And then if I need to find a particular thing, so let's say um, those are names uh, and I need to find a job, right? Because I have some some data associated with job and I'm, I really want to find out how old is he, right? So I have a table and I need to find this row and find the data, right? Uh, how can I do this? How can I find this in a normal table? Yeah. So, but how, how will I do it? Like how many operations do I need to do? How many lookups will I kind of need to do? Yeah. So if this is N, oh, Open, right? Because I need to check, oh, is B1 Joe? No. Is this one? No, 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 right? It's a very inefficient lookup, right? Um, how can I, if I know those are names, how can, could I possibly speed it up? Yeah? Sorry. I could sort it, right? So then I could sort it, and then instead of searching from the, from the start, what can I do? can do a binary search, right? So I kind of start somewhere in the middle and see if I'm like over it or below it and then again start in the middle and so on, right? Or I can try to kind of uh, do some some tricks with it, right? But then um, what will be the complexity here? Log, log n, right? Roughly speaking. Okay, so then what if we use a hash table? 
right? So instead of sorting it, uh, I basically hash my Joes, my names, my records by a hash function. Um, and then I have the hashes here. So accessing uh, accessing a hash is as fast as accessing an index. So if I have my index indices here, uh, two, three, four, and so on, you know, accessing a, an array with index by index is all of what. Or of one, it just kind of give me this index, here it comes, right? Um, so if I have all my hashes here, accessing a particular hash is O of one as well, but we have this property that our hash table will hash multiple things to the same hash potentially, right? So we have um, kind of a list here of possible hash collisions that I have to look up sequentially because um, I, I kind of cannot uh, pinpoint exactly, right? So the initial lookup is O of one plus a small hash collision depending on how, uh, how big our hash space is. If our hash space is large, then I should have those really short. Hopefully just one item, right? Uh, for typical data set that you have. If you have really large number of items, maybe I will have hash collisions and I will end up with two or three, but that should be relatively short, right? So then I would have O of log N, but N is really, really small, right? So it's like two or three items, right? Um, if my hash function is kind of chosen correctly, then what I should end up is I should just have O of one because my data should be here and the, the list should be just of length one, right? Um, so typical hash functions and hash tables are used for a very quick lookup, which is kind of in the order of O1 for uh, looking up data. Um, and it basically stores kind of the hash to value um, and it is a kind of a centralized place where I kind of ask for the data and it does the lookup and gives me the answer, right? So what if I don't want to have this centralized, I want it to be spread among, um, you know, a number of peers. So I have M number of nodes and the nodes will implement this kind of a hashing functionality, but I don't want them to be on a single node because if the node goes down, I can't look up my data. But if I have it spread, among multiple nodes, then one going down will not gonna kill my functionality because I have the other ones working, right? Um, so this is kind of a more robust way of dealing with looking up the information, right? Um, so we have hash table, and then we have a distributed hash table, right? A distributed hash table is a, like hash table, but it works across multiple nodes. So how could we do that? Um, how could we have um, a mechanism for spreading the data around and being able to look it up in kind of a, a distributed fashion? Do you know of any uh, existing systems which you probably use often? Uh, that use this type of hash tables, where it is useful? So what peer-to-peer -peer technologies do you, do you use? DNS, yeah. What else? BitTorrent? Use it. Uh, some of the messaging apps are also peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So a distributed hash table arranges all the nodes on the ring. 
So we we have nodes which are kind of around the uh, the ring, and we want the uh, the ring to be quite uniformly spread. So we need kind of a some sort of unique identifier of the node uh, to be hashed into kind of a uniform space. So for the sake of a thought experiment, what we could use is if we have an IP address uh, and we have a kind of a hash function which maps this IP address to some sort of a numerical space, right, uh, to a number, then we will have kind of each node being mapped to the space in such a way that we will have some order to them, right? So let's say uh, somehow this IP address maps to maybe 21, uh, 43, 51, 60, 64, 70, 99, 100, okay? So those are the existing nodes which kind of uh, um, map to this particular number and they they are kind of spread around the ring. And the ring kind of wraps around. So we know the hashing function has kind of the, uh, the smallest value and the max value, right? Uh, so for, uh, for four bits hashing function, uh, we know that we have the minimum is zero and the maximum is what? 15, right? Uh, so for five bits from zero to 31 and so on, right? So let's say we're using seven bits. So that will be the maximum number is what? 127, and then it kind of rubs back, right? So in our ring, if we're using seven bit hashing function on based on the IP, everything will be laid out in such a way that possibly the very first hash might be zero and the very last hash possibly is one 27 and then the neighbor of 127 will be zero, right? So it drops around, right? In our initial distribution, we don't have those two nodes. We have only those nodes which are here and it ends at 100 and starts with 21, right? Make sense? It can be a kind of random distribution. What we want is the hashing function to be relatively spreading the whole thing across the space, right? If our hashing function, like if we have, I don't know, uh, 31 items and all the items are kind of between 0 and 3, then it's kind of a bad hashing function, right? Because we're not utilizing the majority of the space, right? But if, the, if we have 31 items and they're kind of nicely spread, then that's perfect, right? So here we want this kind of a uniform spread. So we want some hashing function which kind of does that. Uh, and then uh, we effectively will store um, our data. So for the sake of the DHT, we have some data that we want to store and we kind of have the index of, you know, how we want to uh, look the data, right? Um, and the index again is kind of um, the, yeah, so the kind of like uh, hash. Uh, so the index is actually a numerical hash of that data. Um, so if I need to look up something, like if I need to look up um, Joe, right? Uh, then I will kind of hash Joe, I will get kind of the index, and then I will ask these guys, okay, where is it, right? Uh, so first we need to store the data, right? So to store the data, let's say Joe hashes into, um, I don't know, something, 13, right? So if I hash Joe, it hashes to 13 using this uh, from 0 to 127. Uh, and then uh, I kind of ask one of the nodes. So I contact one of the nodes and saying, okay, who is responsible for the index 13? And he will tell me I'm not because I'm responsible for indexes between uh, 51 and 59. So I'm responsible for those, 
because my neighbor on the left is responsible for everything below 51 and the next neighbor uh, which I have here is responsible for 60 upwards, right? Uh, but uh, because you're looking for 13, you need to ask my neighbors from the left side, right? So then I ask this guy and he says, no, I'm not responsible for 13. You probably should ask 21. So I'm asking 21 and 21 says, uh, actually, yes, actually I am responsible for 13 because, no, uh, he's not neither, um, because he's responsible for 21 to 42. Um, so then I need to ask this guy and this guy says, yes, I am responsible for 13 because I deal with the range of between 100 and 20, right? So now I will store Joe with this guy. So this guy will store Joe, which is index 13. So my data point here, 13, is managed by this guy, right? And then when I need to look it up, I kind of run a similar query, and then I get to a who the node who is responsible for storing that particular item, and then I will read it. Um, you see that uh, reading and writing is not a one because I need to do a linear search with m potentially m minus one kind of uh, um, queries. So it's kind of inefficient, right? Uh, but what we can do is. Uh, these guys can, because these guys know who the neighbors are and they can advertise who their neighbors are to everybody. So they can exchange some information about neighborhood and each of those guys can kind of uh, have a simple lookup table which points to the next neighbor. So um, the kind of the next neighbor in the index and then times two the next index and times four the next index. So we kind of have, um, we're progressing kind of uh, uh, exponentially into the, the hops that we, we need. So for the range 51, 59, I'm, I'm responsible. And then I know, I know my next neighbor 60 is here. And then I don't want his neighbor I want the neighbor which is double my range. So I, I kind of uh, store kind of the next guy and then the next guy. So I will store like 120 who is responsible for that one. And then if I wrap it around, yeah, I don't know like what it will be, but then I will have the kind of the next guy there, right? So then if I ask this guy where to store number 13, he will kind of look at up his table and he will point me to the closest node that I should interrogate, right? So then instead of OM, I will end up with uh, log M, right? With this kind of a finger table. Make sense? Yeah. So storing data, reading data, we kind of sort it, but now we also need to sort kind of uh, new nodes coming in and uh, nodes disappearing, right? So if this node wants to disappear, uh, his predecessor will need to take his duty, right? Because this node range is from 100 to 21, but if he disappears or it disappears, then this node needs to cover this range, right? Uh, so normally in this kind of a distributed hash table, this guy and this guy share kind of the same data because if this guy disappears, this guy needs to cover the range. So the data is replicated. So Joe is stored here and here, right? Uh, same for this guy, right? So this guy needs to store his data, his range, which is this, but also he needs to store this range because if this guy disappears, this guy needs to take this, this role. So the predecessor always stores the data from the, from the guy below. You may ask, okay, what if both of them go down, right? We lose some data, right? Because this guy doesn't know this data, right? Yeah, so if you want to make system more robust and prevent a uh, possibility of losing data, you make two predecessors knowing the data forward, right? So if I have M nodes, uh, then I have, depending how much redundancy you want, um, if I introduce more redundancy, I have more robust system, right? 
uh, you know, in the extreme case, everybody knows everything, which means only one node left will know all the data and can continue answering the queries, right? But how likely is it that having M nodes, M minus one will go down at the same time, right? It's very unlikely, right? So you need to ask, okay, how many, how many nodes, how many consecutive nodes can go down at the same time, right? How likely is that? And then you make this redundancy, right? If you think two nodes can go down at the same time, um, then you need to have at least three hops kind of redundancy, right? Um, okay, so this is when the nodes disappear. If the node goes down, it basically tells the other node, like, I'm shutting down, this is my data, you deal with it, right? So that's normal case, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. They will refer. Yeah. So normally they will de defer, but because this finger uh, table is um, is not kind of a one by one, so they will kind of if the um, yeah. So if if I query this node and there is a three hop redundancy and this node already has this data, it's kind of a little bit up to implementation, right? Okay. Uh, you can give the answer directly or you can say this node has the data, right? Okay. Uh, usually in distributed cache tables, the da data is immutable. So the data cannot change. Uh, if that's the case, then this guy should answer it, right? If the data can change, then you have the synchronization problem. So who has the, the kind of the copy, right? So in that case, this guy will be the owner of the data and he will uh, propagate the changes to the caches, right? So these will be caches and this will be the, the main. So it kind of complicates. So it's a little bit dependent. Uh, typically, I would say uh, when with the data being immutable, this guy will not delegate, will answer directly, right? Um, yeah, for efficiency sake. All right, so then we have the problem of new node coming in. Uh, so then uh, the problem is kind of a little bit easier because let's say um, a new node comes in here. So we have a new node which uh, uh, maps 220, comes along, right? And he says, oh, look, I'm new guy, my index is 120, right? So then uh, he needs to find out who is the, the next node. And this guy takes the responsibility of 120 to 20. Right of that range, and then he needs to find who was, who is his uh, previous uh, predecessor, and then the predecessor splits its range because the predecessor had 100 to, to 20 before, but now it will have 100 to 120, and this range, including the Joe item 13, will be passed to this guy. So now responsibility for Joe is passed to this guy, and this guy range kind of shortened and. He updates his finger table and he tells his, uh, like everybody, that his range now is kind of smaller, right? Uh, so this finger table, finger table between indexes uh, and the ranges needs to be updated every time someone comes in or every time someone leaves, right? So there is some sort of a gossip protocol which advertises those kind of uh, messages, right? Uh, funny enough, uh, for doing that, for uh, distributing those kind of announcements, uh, distributed hash table is kind of a good mechanism for, right? So the distributed hash table will use distributed hash table to actually work. So it's kind of a <laughs> kind of a nice feature that to implement the distributed hash table, it's kind of good to have a distributed hash table because then, for example, for any cast, um, so any cast or unicast, you can use a uh, distributed cache table mechanism for announcing things and distributing information. Because, for example, I need to tell uh, certain people about something. And to whom should I tell? I will use DHT to find out where they are, like where they are IP addresses, right? So usually, uh, in this case, I will kind of need to find an IP address or a means of communicating with them. If, if we're using Tor, I would need to find like a kind of a Tor address, right? 
Um, so what we just described here is called chord. Uh, so this is the, the simplest uh, distributed hash table algorithm. It's maybe not the simplest, but it was the first one which was kind of uh, proposed in 1997. Uh, and since then it became quite popular and kind of used a lot of different uh, technology. And you can kind of uh, look, look chord and kind of uh, get a little bit more into it, but the basics are kind of relatively simple, yeah? No, so the, um, you, you will not have, um, you will not have a hash collision in such a way that the data points to two, two uh, nodes but you will have multiple data point, pointing to a single node. So a single node will have multiple hash collisions of data pointing to it, right? So if I have, um, uh, like, if we have Joe mapping to 13, I can have multiple things mapping to 13, right? So I can have overloaded multiple data here that are indexed 13, but it's like a list of items, right? And then this node is responsible responsible for it, but it's only one because of the ranges you don't have collisions. Like the responsibility is kind of uh, distributed, right? Among all the nodes which are here. Yeah. Is this the, how the torrent works? Yes, it's exactly. It's like you can download it. That's right. And the data is spread around the nodes all the time. Yes. So, so BitTorrent uses DHT to uh, distribute the trackers, uh, the, the parts of the file that are kind of uh, used for downloading it, right? Uh, so you can kind of get, gather the data and then you know um, from where to download a particular part of the file. Yeah? Uh, is there any like duplication problem? I don't know, like, let's say the worst case, all of the notes are done and only one left, or one yeah, exactly. So that's what we were discussing here. Um, so you you have um, <laughs> yeah. Let's let's quickly analyze that. Okay. So let's say um, let's say again we have this uh, in, you know index from zero to one twenty seven, and initially let's have uh, I have I don't know one two three four five six seven eight. Eight nodes, right? So I have uh, eight nodes. And then I, ass I assume um, redundancy is two. So I only store my data and my um, next hop data if the, the hop goes down, right? So what will happen is uh, each node stores this kind of a particular range of data. And then let's imagine one of them goes down, right? So this node goes down. So then the predecessor now covers the whole range, right? And then this node goes down. Again, the predecessor covers the whole range. This node goes down. So the predecessor covers the whole range. This node goes down. The predecessor covers the whole range. This node goes down. The predecessor covers this goes. And then eventually this node goes down. So then we end up with one node and it covers the whole data, right? So it still works, right? If the nodes go down one by one, we can just have one still running and it still has all the data, right? And now new node shows up. So then it says, yes, great. I don't need to deal with the whole range. You deal now with the majority. I only deal with that part here, right? And then new nodes comes in. And now this guy is reduced because it doesn't need to answer all the queries. It says, okay, I'm dealing only with this range and you deal with this range, right? So then the new nodes pop up and then the distribution happens again, right? And with the consistent hashing, like if something was mapping to 13, it will map back to 13, right? It will always map to 13. Uh, but this kind of can dynamically happen. But because we only cache two, right? So I, I cache my um, next hop data and this guy caches next hop data. So what will happen in this case if those two go, go down immediately together, right? 
So this guy knew his range and his next hop range, but this guy didn't know this range, right? So this range now is gone. We lost some data, which this node, which was here, uh, knew about. Uh, so that we had originally like this. And this node knew this range, but this node only knew, uh, so this node knew this range and this range, but this node only knew his range and the next range. So if both of them go down, we will have this guy knowing this range, but this one will be missing. So we kind of lost the data, right? If two nodes went down at the same time, right? Without passing the data or crashing or something, right? Because if, if they, if the situation is again like this, and this node goes down first, then this guy takes over the, uh, the duties and tells this guy that now my range is this. So now this node knows the whole range because he knows his range and his next guy's range, which is basically this. So this node now knows everything and this node knows everything as well because this node needs to know his next hop range. So this guy knows everything and this guy knows everything. So one of them can go down and the other already knew everything, right? Do uh, you, you get it? So it depends like if the nodes go down at the same time or if the nodes go down after some time, allowing the distribution of the information to pass, to spread, right? But, but uh, let me see the question. Yep. If the node goes down, how, how the previous node will get the data? Like it's gone. Yeah, that's right. So you, you can have uh, the node going down gracefully, telling the neighbors, I'm shutting down, this is my data, bye, right? Yeah. Or you can have a power plug, you yeah. know, and then the node just disappeared, right? So to prevent this kind of the node just disappeared, you need to tell this data which you're dealing with kind of uh, on a regular basis before, right? So the nodes need to communicate with each other and they need to send information, send, send updates. That's what we were discussing, like uh, who takes the responsibility for updating the cache, right? So if I have um, four nodes and uh, there is an update, so I'm saying, okay, store index 13, and this guy has kind of a, a database or a kind of a lookup table for storing all the data for his range, right? And there is an update. So if I'm edit, edit a line here, this guy should tell his predecessor to say, hey, look, I have a new entry in my, uh, in my table, right? In case this guy disappears, this guy's already know it, right? So every time there is an update, the update needs to propagate to the predecessor or to two predecessors, like depending how much you want to cache, right? Exactly, yes, exactly. All right, perfect. So we kind of, um, we, let's have a short break. We covered um, hashing, we covered, covered consistent hashing, and we covered a court and kind of a distributed hash table, right? Um, so I will talk a little bit about uh, consensus and about blockchains, um, kind of using the, the terminology that we kind of have developed so far. So let's have a short break, uh, 10 minutes. All right.
All right, so I have updated the wiki with this extra lecture, uh, Introduction to Blockchains. Um, so I will cover a little bit um, related material and we'll try to make it um, we'll try to make it as kind of fitting into the flow so you you watching the lecture afterwards will be kind of okay so let's start with the uh, with a bank so Um, with the physical, with the physical world, um, if we, um, let, let's say, um, so we have, we have Alice, uh, Bob and Charlie. So then, let's say, in a physical world, uh, Bob wants to sell something to Alice. And then Alice wants to pay him. Like, how does it happen? Through the banks. Yeah, but without a bank. If you don't want to use a bank. We use cash, right? So, here we have cash. And then uh, Bob has an apple. And he gives Alice the apple, and she gives him cash, right? So now Bob has cash, which Alice used to have, right? So that kind of relies on some of the properties of the cash, right? So what is cash? Something physical. What are the properties it has? Yeah. It has a high value, but it also corresponds to its like material value. Yeah, so it has kind of a nominal nominal value. And what else? Yeah, but specifically about cash. So it's physical. What else? What what what's very important for cash to work? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, so that, that's kind of like this one. What else? Yeah? That you can uh, make false cash. Exactly. So it's very hard to copy, right? Hard to copy. If cash was easy to copy, it wouldn't work, right? If I can print 100 uh, krona bills or 1,000 krona bills like uh, at home, I mean the whole system wouldn't work, right? So this is the kind of the fundamental reason why cash works, otherwise it wouldn't work, right? So now imagine that we want to do this, we want Alice to pay Bob, but electronically, right? So we want to have an electronic, uh, electronic cash, right? Um, and electronic and hard to copy. What is hard to copy on a computer? What do you have on your hard drive that it's hard to copy? Exactly. Yeah. Nothing is hard to copy, right? Inside a computer, nothing is hard to copy. Everything is easy to copy, right? So we have a problem. We have a problem because for cash to work, we need to have a property that it's hard to copy. And everything in the computer is easy to copy. So how do we solve that? 
Yeah, it kind of turns out it's not trivial, right? Uh, so traditional way of solving it is we have banks. And we have banks which kind of uh, keep an account of who has how much cash. But it's not cash anymore, it's kind of electronic cash, right? Uh, so for electronic cash to work, we kind of need a bank because then my bank says Marius has a certain amount of cash, right? So it, it says uh, Marius has, I don't know, like 1,000, and then Alice has 1,000. And then if Alice transfers a payment to Bob, the bank system says, okay, uh, if Bob has 1,000, and Alice make the transfer, then the bank will update it. So it says, okay, now Alice has 900 and Bob has 1100, right? So if there is a transaction between Alice paying Bob, uh, the transaction goes through the payment system, through banking system, and then the accounts are kind of updated, right? And it works because the banks don't make mistakes, right? They, let's assume they don't. And let's assume they don't uh, create new, <laughs> new values here, right? Which is not actually true, but let's kind of assume that. So then it kind of works, right? So now we would like to have this kind of ledger. We would like to have this kind of uh, ledger of who has how much cash. And after someone pays it to be updated, but without the bank, right? So it kind of works with the bank because we kind of trust um, trust the system, trust the, the kind of a payment network. Uh, but if we don't have the bank, how can we kind of uh, maintain a, a, you know, decentralized ledger uh, kind of being consistent? And that's where kind of the blockchain fits in, right? So in, in 2008, uh, Bitcoin was created and Bitcoin basically solves this problem of electronic cash uh, and man maintenance of the ledger of who has what in kind of a global currency uh, way using kind of a cryptography, right? Um, so the way it uses cryptography is um, that um, the accounts don't kind of use names, they use uh, public keys. Uh, so I have a public key associated with a particular amount. Uh, and then every transaction basically spends some of those public key funds to another public key, which might be owned by the same person or might be owned by somebody else, right? Um, so we have a couple of concepts here. Uh, so first, we have the concept of public-private key cryptography. Um, so uh, public-private key. Uh, so we have kind of a symmetric and asymmetric encryption system. What's the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So if and we have, uh, uh, let's kind of make an angry person here, which is a bad guy, right? So in a symmetric key cryptography, uh, this guy key and this guy key is the same. They need to share the key and sharing the key in kind of a hostile environment is difficult, right? We somehow need to securely share a key uh, and then for securely sharing the key, we need encryption and it kind of uh, like it's a, you know, uh, turtles all the way down, right? So the symmetric key encryption, what are the strengths of symmetric key encryption? It's fast. U usually it's much faster than the public-private key cryptography. And um, it's simple, right? Um, so to encrypt and decrypt, um, once the key is shared, then we don't need to exchange anything, right? To solve this kind of a hostile problem, what we can do is we can use a public key, and the private key is kind of never shared, it's kind of a kept, kind of a secure, and the public key 
is the one used to encrypt the information and then I can advertise it. So I can make the public key visible to everybody, even to the host file or end person, right? Um, so then uh, we can use a public key cryptography to uh, map our accounts, right? So again, um, let's let's have this uh, situation with Alice and Bob and Charlie. So Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Alice will have a wallet, and the wallet consists of um, a number of public, private keepers, right? So. Alice in her wallet will have a sequence of those public private keys. Same will have Bob. Um, and then um, Alice will make a transaction. So a, a particular transaction will transfer a money from a public key one to, to public key two, right? And if it happens that the public key two is owned by Bob, this transaction will basically transfer money to Bob, right? Uh, and then uh, we have kind of a, uh, a chain, right? So we have a particular public key zero, which had the original funds, which came from somewhere. This has transferred the money to public key one, which happens to be owned by Alice. So Alice has the private key to this public key. So then she can transfer the, those money. And she transferred those money to uh, public key two, which happened to be Bob's, right? And this transfer is called transaction. And transaction has a public key of the source, a public key of the destination. And it needs to, Alice needs to prove that she has the private key to this public key such that she can make this transfer, right? So the transaction has this public key, this public key, and private key uh, proof that she can sign it. So then uh, there is a kind of a, a proof that she owns the private key. It's not revealing the private key, but it's kind of demonstrating that Kind of she has it by signing the transaction with the private key such that this public key can be compared and verify that she has the private key, right? Um, so with, with public private key cryptography, just a side note, um, I have uh, a private key and a public key for me, and I have a public key for Bob. So what can we do? There are kind of a two operations we can do. I can use public key of Bob to send him a message and then he can decrypt it. So that's what? Encryption, right? I can use his public key to encrypt my data. So if I have an email to him, I can use his public key to encrypt it, give it to him or announce it, and only him will be able to read it, right? Because only he has the, um, the private key to this. To this public key, right? Makes sense? Uh, one question. Yeah. For example, there is David, and he got the Bob's public key. Can he give the credit to Alice or something? So, so uh, there is David, and David has what? David has Bob's public key. Yeah, so David also has this public key. Yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, for my message, David cannot decrypt it because to decrypt it, you need a private key. Oh. And private key only Bob has. Right? So to decrypt, you need a private key. Right? Okay. So now there is a second operation I can do. What I can do is I can sign this message with my private key. Right? I can generate a hash using my private key. And then anybody using my public key can verify that I sign it with this private key, right? So my public key, my public key is public. So Bob knows it, Oops. and David knows it, 
and then I send a message which is now readable but signed by me using my private key and they can verify that okay whoever is the owner of this public key must have signed it right make sense so I can prove the ownership of something by hashing it by kind of signing it and I can um, delegate something that only Bob can read right so there are two operations kind of uh, one is for proving that I have the private key and the other one is uh, Bob can kind of read it because he has a private key so he can kind of unpack something so this first one with the me signing something and then everybody knowing the public key being able to verify it is used here right is used here in this place so we have kind of the chain right of transactions because the funds come from somewhere and they kind of go to another person and so on so now if you want to if Alice would like to send uh, the money from public key one again, it would not happen because she already did that, right? She, th this account is already empty because the money has been transferred somewhere else, right? Uh, so here kind of the system works, but we have a small problem. The problem is that um, everybody has those wallets, everybody has those uh, public keys, uh, and everybody can make the transactions, right? So imagine that um, uh, she has she has the funds in this public key, public key one, and she makes two transactions. Transaction one is she sends it to Bob, and transaction two is she sends it to Charlie, right? So if she sends the money to Bob, and if she sends the money to Charlie, only one of them should happen, right? If you um, tell the bank to transfer, if you have $100 in your account, and you send this $100 to Alice, and at the same time you tell the bank, please send this $100 to, uh, to Charlie, what will happen? Yeah? So I have, uh, th this is the bank, banking system. They know Marius has $100. And now there is a transaction coming in. And the transaction says, send this $100 to Alice. And there is another transaction coming in, which says, send this $100 to Bob. Right? Um, normally, the first transaction which hits the bank will be executed, and the second will be rejected. Right? Um, in practice, sometimes both happen, and then one of them is cancelled, and the funds flow back, right? Um, so sometimes those two transactions are done in two different branches of the banks, and they are kind of start to execute, and one of them finishes, or, you know, finishes a little bit earlier than the other one, or both finish at the same time, and then something, something gets to roll back one of them. So then the funds kind of go back and one of the funds get committed, right? So if I send this money to Alice and Bob uh, using two branches of the bank, uh, I can kind of uh, have it initiated with some delay, but normally whatever happens a little bit faster will be committed and whatever happens a bit later will not, right? So we have a problem of time, right? Time and synchronization, right? And we need to rely on this rollback, right? Um, so if we don't have the bank, if we don't have the trust, and we have kind of a peer-to-peer -peer system uh, where we um, kind of rely on some sort of consensus about the order of transactions, right? So transactions order. So if this is time, they happen. Uh, we have to somehow order them and say the transaction which went to Bob was um, earlier than the attempted transaction to Charlie, so then the Charlie transaction is kind of dis disregarded, right? It's not valid. Uh, and how we can do that in a decentralized system? So we have a peer-to-peer -peer system. We have peers, right? 
they send messages to each other so they can kind of like communicate whoever wants with whoever wants um, and they advertise transactions and then they have to agree uh, you know what is the order of those transactions right and that is the problem which kind of a Bitcoin is solving and the Bitcoin is solving it by having some assumptions so one assumption is that um, all the transactions are grouped into a block so instead of linking transactions directly uh, we group them into a block and then we link the blocks right so this block has a number of transactions and then this block has a number of transactions and the blocks form a linked list Right, so we have a linked list of blocks, and then the earlier blocks will have earlier transactions, and then later blocks will have later transactions. Right, so then if Alice uh, spent, if the if in the earlier block Alice spent a particular public key funds to, to Bob, then the same public key cannot be used in subsequent blocks because those funds are already spent, right? Uh, can they happen in the same block? No, neither, because you cannot have in this list a public key funds spent twice, right? So that is not possible because whoever is uh, creating this block will check if all the transactions are kind of correct and spending the same funds twice is incorrect. So they would not end up here, right? So this is the kind of the mechanism to um, to prevent kind of a du double spending. And the way the prevention happens is with so-called proof of work. So uh, by design, every block is generated roughly by a random search, which takes approximately 10 minutes. So all in, in the network we have some nodes which are dedicated to generating those blocks those are called miners um, and the miners will try to find uh, kind of a cryptographic puzzle which um, signs the valid block so they will take the transactions which are kind of uh, so we have a concept of miner and we have a concept of uh, mempool and mempool is everybody advertises the transactions and the transactions are kind of kept in the mempool before they are included into a block and the miner takes some transactions from the main mempool checks if they are correct uh, tries to find this kind of a cryptographic puzzle to sign the, the block and this process of search takes approximately 10 minutes for the network and then the first miner who finds that block advertises it to the network and then everybody who runs the software checks if this is valid and uses it kind of in, in, includes it into their own version of the chain uh, and then the new puzzle kind of starts and the new miners start to find it um, and the difficulty is adjusted in such a way as to kind of keep the 10 minutes ratio it is possible that two miners um, come up with the blog at the same time right so if I have my uh, blocks, so this is this is blocks, and then we are looking for the new one, and we found this new block. So one miner advertised, so, so miner one advertised this one, and miner two advertised this one, and they are both valid solutions. They they have uh, the proper properties, right? Uh, we called this kind of a fork. So we suddenly have two histories in time because this is our time. So time flows here, and we have kind of a two alternative histories. And then some, some nodes on the network will use this history, and some nodes will use this history. But um, at some point later on, one of them will have a next block, right? So then there is a rule which says the nodes should prefer the longer chain compared to the shorter ones, right? So if the new block was announced following this time history, then whoever was kind of following this one will drop it and will use this one. So this will become an orphan, right? 
So this one will have an orphan uh, block and then all the transactions which were here will be kind of invalid, they will end up into mempool again. And then only the transactions which are kind of um, here are kind of used in the history, right? So if Alice was spending money in twice, into Bob and Charlie, and to Charlie ended up here, and to Bob ended up here, then this one will be invalidated, the transaction to Bob actually never happened, and this one to Charlie happened, and it's kind of recorded in the history, right? Does it kind of make sense? Yeah? Uh, what happens if the, if the two, uh, the two histories have the, the next block comes up at the exact yeah, time so again? again. Or is it so improbable that there is no solution for that? Yes, that's right. No, it is probable. I mean, it is less and less probable to continue for longer versions. But it is possible that the orphan length is two or even three, right? Uh, it is very improbable that it's length four. Uh, so at some point, one of them becomes orphan, right? And because we have this 10 minutes, um, kind of every block is roughly generated at 10 minutes. So if this one was time zero, this one will be kind of a time 10, time 20, time 30, right? Uh, so we say if someone pays you, you should wait an hour and check what's the version of history after like six of those and therefore it will be extremely unlikely that you will have the collision after that, right? Uh, so, as I'm saying, like, uh, length two, three happen, uh, length four, five, six, oh, that's very, very improbable, right? Uh, so then you just need to wait a little bit longer, right? But so eventually one of those chains gets dropped, yeah. But during this time, like, we've got 20 minutes or so, the value that's right, so exactly, right. yes, exactly. So it is kind of, uh, it's not fully confirmed. The transfers are not fully confirmed and you may have those uh, conflicting double spending histories, right? So if someone paid you, um, so if someone paid you and you have the money, you can spend them, right? So you can advertise your, your spending. And then if you, uh, if you spending the money that hasn't been confirmed yet, this spending cannot be confirmed in this history. It can only be confirmed in this history. So if it ends up in this history, so you paid somebody, uh, and then they paid somebody else, and then eventually this took over, all those payments are kind of canceled, right? So whoever you paid actually never happened, right? But also you didn't get the payment, right? Um, so that can cause some problems. But the transaction that were cancelled on the orphan branch will be picked up after the orphan branch drops. That's right. So all the transactions up. from the orphan branches kind of end up in the mempool, and then from the mempool, the transactions which conflict with the history will be removed, and the remaining transactions will be included, right? Uh, so because, let's say, Alice tried to pay you and Charlie, right? And you spent Alice's money, right? So there is an Alice transaction to you and your transaction to somebody else. But that ends up in the mempool, but it's inconsistent because Alice already paid Charlie. So you cannot have another payment from the same public key to you. So those two transactions, the one to you and the one from you to somebody else will be removed from the mempool, right? But if they don't conflict, they will be included and they will end up in the chain, in this history, right? Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. So one transaction will take approximately 20, 15 minutes? That's right. So, I mean, one transaction will take approximately 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, if there is uh, less transaction being generated to the mempool, then they are included in the block, because each block is generated every 10 minutes, right? So if there is not, not a lot of traffic, your transaction can be included into the history after 10 minutes, right? So the fastest you can expect the transaction to be confirmed is 10 minutes, but then you may have some inconsistencies in the process. So you need to wait a little bit for the transaction to be confirmed multiple times, multiple blocks, right? The longer the confirmation length, the more certainty you have that the money that you got are the, or the transaction is actually a real one, right? Yeah. Um, so here we have kind of the concept of time but the time is not absolute, right? We don't actually know uh, when exactly uh, 
this block happen, but we know the relative, right? We don't know up to milliseconds, right? Um, the miner who generates the block, the miner says, okay, this block was generated at a particular time, but they can lie, right? But they cannot lie, so, so they can lie with milliseconds, but that they cannot lie, uh, like, you know, if this, if this guy said it happened at T1, uh, this guy says, okay, it happened sometime, and then this block happens at T3, then this block cannot happen outside of this range, right? Um, so there is a constraint of how much they can lie about the time, right? So usually it is kind of, a, you know, plus minus 10 minutes because on average blocks are kind of uh, every 10 minutes, right? So when exactly something happened, you don't know, but you know roughly within a certain plus minus uh, rate when something happened, right? So all those transactions which are here, you know they happen between this time and this time, between the previous block and the next block, right? Uh, and all the transactions here are after transactions here, and those are after transactions here, right? But you don't know the exact time, right? Yeah? Um, so the, uh, the, there is a limit of how much can be included in the block, right? Uh, and how much transactions that uh, the miner includes in the block is not uh, relevant for calculating this puzzle, right? So the puzzle basically takes this data structure and tries to find a hash with certain properties, and it's kind of a random search. So this, this size matters, but not much, right? What is kind of um, difficult is just finding this kind of a random um, sequence of, um, because, so, so the puzzle effectively is this. We have a certain block uh, and we have a certain uh, nouns which is picked by the miner. So this number here is picked by the number. This is kind of a hard coded because this is just the data, right? This number picked by the miner needs to be picked in such a way that the hash of this plus this number ends up with a particular hash with a number of zeros which are in front, right? So if you have a hashing function and you're trying to find some kind of a hash which has certain properties, it's kind of a random process and you're kind of randomly searching for this number to give you this, this number, right? So there is no relationship of how big this is to this, to this search, right? So the computational power is kind of uh, always constant, right? In a sense, uh, how many transactions are here kind of matters how long you need to wait for confirmations. Because let's say, for the sake of argument, let's say every block can only con contain 200 transactions, right? So then I have time zero. After 10 minutes, I have 200. After 20 minutes, I have 400 maximum, right? If within those half an hour, I have 1,000 transactions coming in, they will kind of uh, buffer up, right? So they will kind of, the, my mempool is growing while I'm kind of including some transactions here. So if you have a new transaction, it will not be confirmed in 10 minutes, it will be confirmed maybe after an hour, right? And if there is kind of a more and more transactions coming in, there is a longer and longer delay between me submitting a transaction and getting a confirmation, right? Uh, so that is the problem. So the problem of the scaling is how many miners are there uh, but that kind of relates to the hardness of the problem because the hardness is picked always to be roughly 10 minutes, right? So if I have more, more miners, the blocks will not be generated any faster. That, it's just that the puzzle will be harder for them to kind of spend a more computational power on, on solving it. All right, so um, any other questions about this? I want to stress this kind of order, right? The order and the time. Uh, so in the lecture, which I kind of recorded, it, it is mentioned, but it's not as explored. And here it is kind of the essential component. The essential component is that in this kind of a decentralized network, uh, we don't know precise time, we know kind of the relation, relative time between the events. But that's all we need. Uh, so if we know that when Alice was spending money to Bob in one transaction and we know that in another transaction she was spending the money to Charlie, 
and this transaction was earlier than this one, we know that this one is the valid one than this one, right? If the, if the funds were from the same account. All right, so that's, um, that, that's it for today. Uh, I will like you to, um, to check those videos which are in the, in the course description. Uh, and that one is, um, yeah, that one is 50 minutes. This one is about an hour and this one is about an hour. So you have about three hours of lectures. You can kind of watch them on a faster pace. Uh, so please use the tomorrow's time to kind of um, go through this. And I will post some of the peer-to-peer uh, -peer libraries that we would like to play with in the kind of Android programming. All right. And then the next week, uh, we will see. We will either have the li Lightning Network introduction or the um, self-sovereign identity systems introduction. So we'll kind of explore more the space of uh, decentralized identities. Uh, and we will kind of deal with the with the financial aspects a little bit more um, in decentralized systems. All right. Thanks.